so uh, this afternoon, I'd like you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. It's a very familiar passage. You've all heard about Philip and the eunuch and the, how things developed there for this man, the eunuch, to get saved. I don't know how about you, but I can always improve in sharing the gospel. I'm always learning new methods, new strategies. In fact, I bought this book that I really highly recommend, uh, written by Gregory Colt, uh, and it's called Tactics. And it has, it says, a game plan for discussing your Christian convictions. And I, and I would add, without getting killed. <laughs> Um, highly recommend it. I'll be make, making some mention of that later on. Here in this chapter, if you will, uh, turn to chapter 8, verse 26 through uh, 39. <coughs> uh, there's a great revival taking place in Samaria, and Philip is enjoying every moment of it. He's having the time of his life seeing how the Lord is working through many, many people and how they are coming to the Lord. Not, not a better place in the world to be a missionary at that moment than this one. But it says in the middle of that, in verse 26, And the angel of the Lord, and, and the, uh, and the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch a great, uh, of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran tither to him, or tither, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he decided, Philip, that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so open he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the, from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? And Philip opened his mouth and began at this same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came onto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Let's pray. Lord, we've read this story many times. But as we think about how to improve our witness, mm -hmm. our reaching people with the gospel, I pray that we will be able to... Uh, glean some principles, some methods here that we might be able to use even in the year in which we live, 2,000 years later. I pray that you will help me, uh, may have your spirit move mightily through my mind, my lips, that the word that I preach, Lord, will be honorable to you. Lord, we don't, don't want to preach anything new. We want to kind of stick to what the scripture says. So I pray, Lord, that uh, as we look into this event one more time, we will uh, look uh, into it, Lord, with maybe from a different direction. Um, I can see how Philip used simple questions, Lord, to open conversation. And Lord, I think this might be a way that we can reach more people today. One of those tactics that we can use to see how 
the spiritual environment is with, the, with those people who we try to reach. I pray that all of us will be open to this message so that, Lord, every one of us during this coming week will be ready to share the good news of salvation with others. We never do enough. So, Lord, I pray that this message will be one of those that we hold dear to our heart and that we immediately practice as soon as we leave this church this afternoon. Be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. The year was 34 A.D., Philip, one of the deacons of the new church in Jerusalem, fled from Samaria uh, to Samaria during the persecution led by Saul of Tarsus. And there immediately began to preach the gospel, and a great revival erupted. Now, in the middle of all that, we see in verse 26 that the angel of the Lord, read with me again, verse 26, and the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south, Onto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And I don't know about you, just reading that, you would think, Lord, that doesn't make any sense. I'm having the time of my life. I've always wanted to experience a revival. And I'm seeing people come to you to receive your Savior every day, practically. This is where the Holy Spirit is, and this is where I want to stay. I want to continue doing this for the rest of my life, if possible. Continue seeing people getting saved. But in the middle of this wonderful success, the Lord says, Hey, Philip, i got a plan for you. The Lord, it was very clear. You need to live this area in uh, Samaria and need to go to this other place called Gaza. Now, I googled this and I found that from Samaria to this area in Gaza, approximately there's 118 kilometers. So it's not like taking a walk down to Tremolinos. Uh, you're going to have to spend a few days on the road, and it's going to be a dusty road. Never know what you're going to find in that road. Uh, I don't know about you, but I would not be encouraged to make a trip like this, especially when I'm having such a good time uh, enjoying how, the, you know, how the, the, the Lord is working in the lives of people. And in the middle of this situation, of course, Philip had no idea what was going to happen. I don't think he had any information of what was going to happen, but... The Lord was arranging everything in a masterful way. And we see that as soon as he gets there, probably a, a week later, he comes across this man. He doesn't give us the name. Uh, he was an Ethiopian, uh, Ethiopian. Look with me at verse 27. And he arose and went, went and he be, and behold, like voila. <laughs> it's like uh, bringing the cat, the, 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 the rabbit out of the, out of the head. Behold. Here it is. Never expected to see this man. And a man, Ethiopian. And the most remarkable thing about this man, he wasn't just a common uh, individual just walking down the, the, the road. It, was, it says, of great authority under the Kand Kandasi, queen of the Ethiopians. And it gives us some more information, who had the charge of all her treasure. This would be almost like a minister of economy. Not just anybody. Now, another strange thing you find is that this man, this Ethiopian man, had traveled from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship. To worship. Doesn't give us any more reasons. Maybe he, there was some business that he had to do there. We don't know. The text doesn't say it. But his, his whole reason to go there was to worship. Now, again, this might not uh, seem very uh, important to you, but if I said, hey, we're going to have to do 2,480 miles by foot or by, by chariot, that would be 3,991 kilometers to worship. Any volunteers? You, I'm trying to put some perspective here. Everything that's happening here is very extreme. 118 kilometers to go from where you are to this desert place? What's waiting for me there? All you find there is snakes and scorpions. Doesn't make any sense. Surely you would have to do this by faith. And then who would you find there? And on the way back from Jerusalem, back home, you find this Ethiopian man doing another 2,000 
480 miles approximately to get to home. But he's got some good literature with him, a good book. Now, the, the, the text doesn't say um, that he uh, traveled alone, uh, but I think it was more like in a caravan. And, uh, you know, a, a man of this stature would, of this position, would probably never travel alone. Uh, it gives us some information about him. He was like a cabinet minister to the queen, a very relevant uh, uh, individual, the kind of individual that don't kind of mix with everybody they meet in the street, especially, especially a, a, a foreigner who's kind of running beside your caravan, saying, hey, oh, excuse me, <laughs> what are you reading? You know, get him out of here. I wonder what he wants. So maybe, you know, sometimes we see those that want to clean the windows in the, in, the, in the traffic light. And you say, oh, no, 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 thank you very much. We're just begging, you know, no, I don't want to, be, I don't want to mess with this. Who's this guy that's running beside me in the middle of nowhere asking me a question? What, what, are you, what are you reading? Do you understand what you're reading? But you know, that simple question opened up the opportunity to share the gospel to an individual who is seeking answers for his spiritual condition. He had done close to 3,000 kilometers, um, or should I say, yeah, 3,000 kilometers to go to Jerusalem, comes out of the most religious center of the world, I believe, come, came in, coming back this, as empty as he went to Jerusalem. But now he's ca carrying something with him. And you're talking about uh, uh, um, um, uh, 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 where's the word? Uh, coincidences. He's reading Isaiah 53. And you all know what Isaiah 53 is all about. You would think there's just too many coincidences here. Or are they coincidences? Or is it maybe God who is orchestrating this? So when I see a story like this, I say, you know, Lord, I would, I would, I would love to experience the situations like this every day. Where I'm, you know, just uh, uh, preaching and all of a sudden I get a voice. Uh, maybe the Lord's speaking to my heart saying, you know, you're having a good time here in Arroyo. Why don't you go to Marocco, Marrakos, and go to the Atlas Mountains, and uh, we'll see what you can find there. And then, uh, have any of you have gone to the Atlas Mountains in Morocco? You know what you find there? Mountains. <laughs> and dirt. And it's just desert. There was one time we went driving from uh, Marrakesh, uh, to down to this uh, adobe house, very famous, I'm sorry, house, a, a city. It, it, on the map, it was like 200 kilometers, and I thought, oh, no, piece of cake, we can do that in two hours. We get up at 9 o'clock in the morning, by 11 we'll be there, we'll probably spend a couple of hours just going around, taking some pictures, having lunch, <laughs> and by 4 o'clock we're back home. That doesn't work in Morocco. We were four hours on, on, uh, into the, the journey, we had come to this place where there was nothing but just mountains around us. And there was a guy who was running down the hill with a big rock on his, on his arms. And I'm thinking, what? And I thought, I wonder if he wants to throw that at us or something. You know, I didn't know what to think. But I, I stopped. I thought, maybe he needs help. And he wanted just to send this um, geode uh, to us, which I bought very, very cheaply. But he, he wasn't like Philip wanting to share a message with me. But I can just imagine that scenario with Philip running by the chariot. Now there's some important truths that I think we can glean from this passage that will help us greatly in our spiritual walk, especially in the way we uh, evangelize. The first thing I want you to see is that Philip simply asked a question, a very simple question, a very, an opener to the conversation. Listen, if you say, Pastor, I just don't know how to witness, start with a question. This is where this book comes in. It gives you very good clues on how to engage, how to ask, you know, how to get into conversation without no threat, always on the steering wheel, always in control of the conversation by simply asking questions very kindly. You just want to know, and you're really interested in knowing what the other person thinks. So Philip comes with this question. <laughs> Can you see the picture? And then 
Uh, excuse me, um, I was just wondering, I, I was kind of hearing over the noise of the chariots and everything. Do you know what you're, do you understand what you're reading? <sighs> and the guy is looking, he says, not really. Uh, would you, uh, you know, I got 3,000 kilometers to go. I wonder if you would be, uh, join me. Uh, maybe you can help me out. I don't know if uh, Philip expected uh, that kind of answer, but it beats walking. Right? Get on the chariot. And all the way, you know, if, I believe that Philip, if he had, we would, we would have given him a, a few weeks, he would have been able to just teach and teach and teach and teach and teach all the way to Ethiopia. But, you know, he had a few hours on his hands. And uh, he just had, simply asked the question. So listen to me. You say, I cannot witness. I don't know how to... Uh, share the gospel. Simply ask questions and be very honest about them. Be, be, uh, and be honest and be really concerned for the answer. Be concerned about the person. Ask a question. This man stops immediately in the chariot and he says, come on, get on, on the chariot. But there's something about praying before you come to a situation like that. Remember we looked into Colossians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, where we talked about Paul asking for prayer. Before you even get into conversation with others, be praying that God opens the opportunity, that God establishes maybe what I call a divine encounter. And that once the opportunity comes to speak, that you do it gracefully by maybe asking a question. And then, then, you know, not be a Bible basher, you know the term, but simply be very concerned about, you know, what they believe and, and, uh, and why they believe the way they believe. I believe questions are great door openers. In Colossians, again, if you look with me there, just to remind you what we studied uh, some weeks ago, in chapter 4, verse 3, you notice that Paul is asking the believers to please be praying that the Lord would produce what I call divine encounters. It says, verse 3, verse 2, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us. Be praying for us, he says. What, how can we pray for you, Paul? Well, that God would open unto us a door of utterance. This is exactly what God had done for Philip. To speak the mystery of Christ. Now when this Ethiopian was reading Isaiah 53, it was a mystery to him. He had no clue what he was reading about. And he asked the question, who is he speaking about? Is he speaking about himself? Is he speaking about some other individual? I have no idea. This is very interesting literature. And I believe this is prophetic literature. But I have no clue, I have no idea what this is all about. And this question led to this individual saying, please get in on, into my chariot and please explain. There was a, a booklet uh, written by a man called Bill Fay, which is titled, Share Jesus Without Fear. And it gives some opener, some... Um, Witnessing openness. For example, one way that we can start a conversation is simply by asking, do you have any kind of spiritual beliefs? What do you believe in? Um, I found that no matter who it is, when you ask, if you show interest in uh, on people's beliefs, they will open up and say, well, I believe this, I don't believe that. Uh, most of the people I've come across, they're all atheists. And I go then from that answer, oh, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. Oh, is that right? What brought you to be not believe in God? Do you believe, do you understand that not believing in God is a belief system? And then you can go on from there. So you start with a, with a question. What, are your, what kind of beliefs do you have? Or do you think there's a heaven or a hell? And they say, well, I don't think there's a heaven. And then you can ask them, uh, what brought you to that conclusion? Don't try to uh, wrap up the situation and try to bring him to the Lord in five minutes. I've seen that happen with preachers back in the States. Hey, Brother Sam, we're going out soul winning this Saturday. Would you like to join us? Sure. I was in 
for that kind of thing. And we would go and they would do the door knocking thing. And uh, I saw this pastor winning in one hour four people to the Lord. If you believe that that can be done. But when I saw him reaching the people, he would knock on the door and he would immediately, when they opened the door, he would put his foot between the frame and the door so they wouldn't, and then he would start witnessing to them, uh, uh, you know, between the crack and then even leading them. So, you know, if you, again, if you believe that this is the right way of doing it, in five minutes he would have a convert. I thought there's just something not right about that. There's something wrong. Maybe he doesn't understand how this whole thing is to be done. It was very puzzling to me. And when we met the other men about an hour later, uh, they, all, they were all reporting in the form how many people got saved that day. Fourteen people. And I said, this happens every Saturday? Oh, yeah, this year we've led to the Lord over a thousand people to the Lord. And how many of those come to the church? Oh, well, only have about 20 people that come to the church. In one year, you've led 1,000 people to the Lord, and you only have about 20 coming to the church. There's something wrong there. You see what I mean? So don't be ready to close the deal in one sitting. Uh, you need to develop a relationship if you have the possibility. Of course, Philip did not have that possibility here. He only had a few hours to, to do this. But he, he started with this, these questions. Another question you can ask, if you were to die today, the typical question, where would you go? Now, that's not very well received with people, especially if they're, if they're in the hospital. <laughs> I remember Brother Eddie, a friend of, his, a friend of a friend who was in the hospital and he said, would you, would you kindly go and visit him? And this guy was close. When he went into the room, this guy who had never seen Brother Eddie was just there with his eyes closed, and he didn't know what to do, so he started reading Psalm 23. In some circles, when you do that, it's for a funeral, right? And this man, when he started hearing the words which he recognized, he was thinking, hey, maybe, maybe I'm dead. I didn't know it. I didn't. Yeah. There's some things that you just need to be careful about. But, you know, you can ask different questions. You can try different things. If the person says, no, I don't believe in heaven. I don't believe in hell, but I do believe in God. Well, then try to work yourself into another question that before, before you start throwing verses at the person. What do you believe? Uh, what do, you th what, do you believe in truth, for example? Things, things like that that will get uh, a conversation going. You can use different examples. With this man called uh, Gregory Koch, uh, there's uh, several um, um, patrocinadores, uh, sponsors, uh, in this book. In the, at the end, one of them is Frank Turek. Have you ever heard any uh, Frank Turek uh, uh, in, in university campuses uh, debate uh, uh, college professors and students? His response to this book was, I wish I knew these tactics 20 years ago. They are some of the best I've ever seen to help Christians be more effective ambassadors for Christ. There's other ones there. It says, I enthusiastically recommend tactics. It will revolutionize your, conver your conversations with non-Christians. A man called Gary R. Habermas says, tactics is not only a required read, but Simply a delightful, entertaining resource. Just try to put it down. I mean, just, yeah, just try to put it down. It's, 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 you're not going to be able to. Another one, J.P. Moreland says, Koch has written the authoritative treatment of how to employ strategies in conversations with unbelievers. Tactus is not just another apologetic book. I recommend it highly. This is the second edition. This is thicker than the first edition. And he adds some more things. I've read uh, through it. Uh, I think I need to read it again very attentively because it's really helped me in, the, in, my, approach to, in my approach to people. I, feel, I, I meet people all the time in the elevator. You only have a few seconds. You only have nine floors to speak to that person. So you need a very, very uh, um, short uh, openers. Uh, Sometimes you have a chance to uh, meet people in the cafe, uh, people you've met before. Uh, sometimes you only have a few minutes to 
to share something. You will start with uh, wonderful weather here in Andalusia. Yeah, we have the best weather. And then you kind of throw in little pointers, little sensors to see how uh, the spiritual uh, situation is with the individual. But we need, to, uh, we need to go there intentionally asking questions like a pro to probe and see what's going on in their life. And believe it, sometimes you might come across individuals like this Ethiopian man who are really open to spiritual uh, matters. So first, figure out some good openers, some questions that you can ask. Don't be afraid. Do your homework before that and make sure you pray that the Lord would equip you. That the Lord would give you boldness, not a scare away from situations, but actually walk in. And if you have some tactics, it will be much easier for you. Be ready for it. Be asking the Lord to prepare situations, to prepare the hearts of people. You might be talking to 10 people and fa not fail. You never fail if you open your mouth and try to share the gospel. When you fail is when you don't, if the Lord is prompting you to do it. But there's always someone within those 10 people, 20 people, wherever it is, that are genuinely interested. And that sometimes they really open up and say, you know, I'm, I really enjoy this conversation. Can we meet another day? Well, sure, let's go and let's meet for coffee. There's something about meeting for coffee that people are always attracted to. And around the very... You know, a, a pleasant atmosphere that we can enjoy here. We can, again, start smoothly. Start with questions. Be asking questions very kindly. Be, be thinking about what they're answering. And then maybe throw some tougher questions depending on their answers. But don't be afraid. And if you tend to be afraid, if you tend to just move away from the opportunity, be asking God. Tell him, say, Lord, I... I, I shrink when these opportunities come. I just don't find it in me to open my mouth and share Jesus. He knows that. Tell him, Lord, I, I'm fearful. But have, help me have faith. Help, help me overcome this fear by simply opening my mouth. If, if, I, would, if I would have been Philip, I would have, I would have been intimidated by the situation. This is not just an ordinary or a chariot, this is a very prominent individual. It's, it's like if I was just walking down the street and you see three uh, police motorcycles and then this big limousine with the, uh, with the, the, um, the flags in front of it and then maybe three more uh, mo motorcycles with police and then with, you know, they stop for a moment and I'm just across the, the, uh, the sidewalk and, they, they, and, they, and I see them, they're reading the Bible. How many of you would dare say, excuse me, when you have policemen all around you? Uh, I see you're reading the Bible. Are you interested in spiritual things? Maybe you'll have two guys breathing down your neck saying, what are you doing? Get out of the way. But, you know, that, that would be very intimidating. But it that didn't seem to be intimidating because notice what Philip, how Philip responded in verse 30. And Philip did what? Three words. I'm sorry, three letters. He ran. He didn't want to waste the time. A minute later, he would have, the, the opportunity would have gone. It would have disappeared. He needed to move in when the door was open. And notice that what this man is reading is Isaiah 553. How many of you would be able to share the gospel by reading, by opening up what Isaiah 53 is all about? How many of you could go to the Old Testament? By the way, that's all the apostles had in the early church to witness. Remember when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost? What did he use? He didn't have the New Testament. He used the Old Testament. What did Jesus use to reveal himself to some of the disciples? The Old Testament. What is Philip using here to reveal Christ, the Messiah? The Old Testament. What does Paul use in order to witness or to preach to the church and to unbelievers? The Old Testament. By understanding the Old Testament, you can preach the gospel. And I don't think there's any better passage than Isaiah 53. Uh, the Lord is really laying out the carpet for Philip. And so, my, at this point, I want you to understand that if the Lord is opening an opportunity for you, your, own, your adequate response is to run 
and uh, take advantage of the opportunity. If you're working in a hotel, if you're working in an in a, in a administrative work, whatever you are, there's always opportunities. But you need to be prepared when the opportunity comes to take to step in. So instead of run, running away or just leaving it for another day, swallow your pride, suppress your fear, and open your mouth. Start speaking. Um, do what, what the Nike slogan uh, says, just do it, right? You've, read, you've seen that, I'm sure, in the sports <coughs> stores. <coughs> So we, he opened uh, Isaiah 53. Notice he said, and from that passage, Lord, notice verse 35. Uh, Philip, Philip then opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. He's using the same passage that this man is reading. And notice how he's using that scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So I can imagine um, this unit passing the roll over to uh, Philip, Philip moving into verse uh, 53, verse 4, where it says that Christ took upon himself our spiritual griefs and sorrows and was smitten for us. Notice he's preaching Jesus, using this uh, passage, and he's explaining this. Then moving on, I think, it, I think Philip was an expository preacher. Because he's using uh, all of this chapter to preach Jesus. So I think he's going for one point. He probably had more than three points. I'm only kidding. Okay, give me a smile at least. Lighten up. Isaiah 53.5, Christ was wounded for our transgressions and our rebellion. He was beaten for our punishment. You know what this mean, means, uh, sir? This means that Jesus Christ is a fulfillment of prophecy. What you're seeing here, by the way, you, you went, you're coming from Jerusalem, didn't you? You probably heard some Christians over there talking about this. You probably heard that this Christ, this man called Jesus, had been crucified. This is, this is a fulfillment of Scripture, sir. When, we read, when you read there, verse 5 is not talking about Isaiah himself. He's talking about this individual who 700 years later will fulfill this prophecy and it was fulfilled perfectly with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he moves on to verse 6. In our sinful ways he have, we have turned from God to our own ways and God placed on Jesus Christ the iniquity, our punishment that we deserved. Oh, don't miss verse 7, sir. Because there's so much in here that talks about what Jesus did for you and for me. Verse 7, he was oppressed, that means he was forced, and afflicted, that means he was humiliated for us. Yet he endured it quietly. And sir, let me say this, none of us would do something like that quietly, but he did it without any complaint for you and for me. Oh, and don't forget verse 12, sir. Look what it says. And he died, he, died, uh, uh, he, he died with criminals to pay for my sins and your sins, making intercession for our rebellious sins. Sir, he did this for you and for me. He did it for me just a few uh, months ago. And sir, he's willing to do it for you too. We don't know how long Philip traveled with this man, how long he was in this man's company, how long the conversation went, but notice that the Holy Spirit is in this from the beginning. It was already working this out in Samaria. He was already working it out when this man, this eunuch man, came out of Jerusalem and now is traveling. The Lord is orchestrating this. There's a lot of things going on. Now this caravan just appears um, and Philip moves in to share the good news. And uh, as Philip opened up this chapter, this, this man, this man, this man's heart was convicted. His heart was moved. And finally understood and believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died on the cross to pay for his sins. And he placed his trust on Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you this afternoon. If you're not saved, 
I hope you will take that move too and respond, what do I need to be baptized? Whoa, hold on a second. Before you get baptized, you need to get saved. You need to know the Lord as your personal Savior. You need to believe in Him. This man immediately responded. Uh, maybe he was Andalusian. He was very open up about you know, his ways. What do I need to be, be, you know, to be baptized? Way, hold your horses. You need to believe first. Well, there's some water over there. Uh, you need a bath or something? No, I want to be baptized, but I, you know, I, I, I got this right. The way this man responded it was like a burst of everything that Philip had been explaining to him through that road that, during that time. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. All condensed, everything that, uh, that Philip had been teaching him in Isaiah 53, all condensed in that burst that he expressed. Now, oh, be, be ready always to have different methods. Uh, we, uh, we did a video not too long ago with Brother uh, Hector. The first time he ever was in front of a camera, he was very nervous, didn't know what to do. We were trying to help him out. And at the end, after a lot, a lot of work, he managed to get a video together of about seven minutes, if I get it right, in which he explains the gospel using the bridge uh, illustration. Did you know, brother, there's a, over 175 hits on the video on YouTube of over 500 hits on, on, on the other platforms that, you know, this is a wonderful, this is wonderful news. A lot of work being, being put there. We'll never know the, uh, the, the, the result of that, 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 uh, that work. You can use the, bri the bridge illustration. You can use the Romans road illustration. I have one here that I picked up the other day, which is always very interesting. Uh, you, you go like this, you say, God loves you, John 3.16. Uh, I have sin uh, sinned, Romans 3.23. Christ died for me, Romans 5.8. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, Romans 5.8. Then uh, I... If you believe, then you will be going to heaven, 1 John 5, 13. And then in the middle, in the palm of the hand, I am God's child, John chapter 1, verse 12. You can use the, the palm uh, illustration, the gospel hand. You can use many different ways, but use some. If you're going to be talking to kids, there's uh, what you call the gospel in colors. Different colors illustrate different uh, aspects of our spiritual condition and uh, salvation and so on. But have something that you're familiar with. You don't know what passages to use. We have a rack over there with all, all kinds of tracks that gives you key verses that you can use if the opportunity comes. But don't just say, you know, well, I, I just can't do it. I'll leave that for missionaries. I'll leave that for pastor. I'll leave that for the team. We're, we're all called to be ambassadors for Christ, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here we have a wonderful example of a very common man he used to be a deacon in the church of Jerusalem, and now he is an evangelist, and he's enjoying this ministry, both in Samaria. It's a little puzzle of what's going on here in Gaza with this individual. He doesn't really understand what God is trying to do with all this, but he's willing to obey and let God do the rest. And boy, when this man gets saved, yes, he's baptized, and all of a sudden they separate. They, go, they probably never saw each other again. You wonder what ever happened to that Ethiopian man, that eunuch. Well, we know one thing. He had 3,000 kilometers to do. By the time he got there, he was probably, probably anxious to share the wonderful experience that he had to share with his friends and family. We don't know much about this man. But according to tradition, you know what tradition? Tradition can go different ways. But according to tradition, many believe that the gospel entered Ethiopia through this individual. And seeing how God organized this whole thing, I believe that could be true. How God can use anybody in the middle of nowhere to share the gospel to another individual who we, we don't know where he's going and do tremendous things with it. I think I've shared with you my testimony. When I got saved, it was three men that the Lord used to influence in my life. And one of them that led me to the Lord was Johnny Carrillo. Of course, there was another right-hand man who was Steve Pico there. 
Uh, and Steve um, did all the hard work. He had to, uh, at work every day when he had the opportunity, he would come towards me with a very ridiculous smile on his face. I hated that smile when I was lost. And he would always have this sticking out of his uniform pocket, this New Testament, the Gideon's New Testament. And every question that I threw at him, very arrogantly, as a good Spaniard, of course, he would be able to open up his New Testament and slice me down like salami. I couldn't beat him. There was no way I could debate with this guy. And it's about, Steve, you tell me what you believe. Not what the book says, what you believe says, but Sammy, I believe what the book says. I couldn't catch him. I couldn't corner him. And so the next day I would try. I hope he comes again and throws me some of those ridiculous things that he likes to share with everybody in the squadron. And he threw me some things that would again would slice me into pieces. And at home, those things would roll in my head endlessly through the night, giving me no peace at all. I always say that Steve prayed, I mean, played dirty because when I finally came to the church, everybody knew me. And when I, uh, they stretched their hand to salute me, they said, oh, you're, you're Sammy, right? Yeah. Uh, how, have we met? Uh, no, 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 but we know all about you. <laughs> what? Yeah, we, all of us pray on Wednesdays. We get together and pray for you. We know everything about you, and we... You know, they were praying, they were playing dirty. <laughs> I mean, you can resist Steve Pike or you can resist Johnny Carrillo, but how do you resist the Holy Spirit? It came to the point where I said, I pr thank you, all of you, for praying for me because it was that praying, that backup, that gave Steve and Johnny the utterance, the ability to come again and again and again, receive nothing but reproach from me, but coming with love and grace. It was because of them, of course, and you. But it was really because of the Holy Spirit. It was all these things working together. When we put all this machinery, again, allow me to use that expression, all these tools together, things happen. But we've got to be ready to open our mouths. So use different methods. And the third thing, those who truly trust Christ desire to follow him. Look at verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came onto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? To which uh, Philip responded, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, folks, I need to make some, uh, um, some uh, warnings here. Some people out there might think that you need to be baptized to get saved. No, baptism always takes place after salvation. You don't need to be baptized to be completely saved. You say, well, I know that, but is there, is there really people out there? Yeah, there are evangelicals out there who say, yeah, you need the sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross. You need the blood atonement. But unless you get water baptized, you're not going to experience full salvation. I've come across several of those. Baptism does not save. It is Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross that saves Baptism is by immersion and it's always after salvation, never for salvation. It is a picture of the death of the resurrection. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that we need to be baptized to be saved. And nowhere in Scripture does it teach that babies need to be baptized. Amen? I'll say that again. Nowhere in Scripture does it teach that babies need to be baptized. Amen? Amen? Now, if you're not persuaded of that, I want to talk to you at the end of the service. But, because, you know, you, you, you can preach on this, and then some months later you come with, uh, uh, to somebody and say, well, I believe that, you know what, baptizing replaces the, the circumcision of the Jews, and I think it's a good um, mem uh, a thing that we can do to introduce the children into the church by baptizing. I mean, it's not even a biblical baptism by immersion. It's sprinkling, you know, and, and, they, and they, say, they believe this. 
And I wonder, where were you when all the preaching was going on? Didn't you check this out? Didn't we talk about this through discipleship? But then somebody comes up and says, oh, but somebody told me that it's a good thing. Well, it doesn't hurt anybody. Well, it does because it's contrary to Scripture. And we see a very good example of this with the eunuch. What do I need to be baptized? Well, you need to believe, first of all, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you can be baptized. Never before salvation. Always after salvation. Never for babies. Always for uh, professing Christians. People who profess to, uh, 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 and believe in the salvation work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's always the first step of obedience. And let me, let me tell you something else, folks. You can be saved, and you can be baptized. But there's also something very important that we need to consider, and I want to throw this at you kindly. Church membership. This morning we had the privilege of, uh, of uh, accepting Brother uh, Tomas and Elena as members of this church. We went through the procedures, and very soon I'm going to ask them to come to the English-speaking service to... Do the same with you. Church membership, is that important? You say, but pastor, church membership is not explicit in Scripture. Doesn't, there's no verse in the Bible that says that you have to be a member of a church. Yeah, it's not explicit, but it is implicit. And you can find very good hints about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 3, 1 Timothy 5, 9, Acts chapter 2, verse 41 through 47, 1 Corinthians 5, 12 through 13, Acts chapter 18, verse 27, and on and on and on. There's many passages that show that the early church had some control, some way of accepting those in the church to be members so that they could continue the work that God had called them of discipleship. The practice of voting for members requires one to be a member. Sending out missionaries. Who's going to send them if you're not a, 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 a member of the church? And even church discipline. How, how can you discipline a person who's not even a member of the church? Uh, there's so many, there are so many different passages that teach us that it is important for us to be members of a church. A church that we can give accountability to and that we can call for protection. These things are very important. And if you want a very clear passage about how to enter into a church membership, go to Acts chapter 2. Those who are baptized enter into the church. I wish we could experience that kind of growth, Brother Tim. From 120 to 3,120. Amazing. But it all happened after, after salvation and baptism. So, folks, what I'm trying to say this afternoon, don't be afraid of opening your mouth. Have some kind of strategy. If you don't have any, if you're kind of afraid, uh, you know, get books like this one. It's not very expensive. You can read it uh, probably in two or three nights, uh, two, two or three afternoons. And it'll give you so much insight that next time you come across somebody, you will be, um, you'll, be, you'll find it very easy to start a conversation. It doesn't have to be threatening. It can be very simple, very friendly. Always you having control, being on the steering wheel, making sure that uh, the person is understanding what they're saying. A lot of people say a lot of things that they, they, don't, they don't even believe or they don't even understand. And you have to explain it to them. But it all starts with a question. It all starts with throwing a pro, throwing a sensor to see the spiritual environment within, with that person. Questions are great gospel openers. Then use the scriptures, memorize some verses. You don't need a whole bunch. You can preach the gospel with Romans 6.23, just one verse. By the way, the bridge uh, illustration is all based on Romans 3.23. Learn some verses. Be ready to share them with those who are willing to listen. Then those who truly trust Christ desire to follow Him. The other day I, I, I was talking to a, a, a gentleman here. He said, you know, uh, we want to be uh, church members. Um, if you want to be a church member, start by being faithful to the church. Amen? Are you convinced of that? 
if you're going to be a church member, make sure that you're willing to serve. And they say, well, uh, well, I'm looking for the perfect church. Well, keep on looking. You're never going to find it. But make sure you commit yourself to a church body, to the Lord Jesus Christ first, then to the church body. Don't be afraid. Follow the steps. And here again, I'll finish with this. We have a, a tremendous example of how we can reach different kind of people. Even a diplomat like this Ethiopian man. Simply by asking questions. But make sure you do your homework. Come again and again to the Lord and say, Lord, please use me. I want to be your instrument. I want to share the good news. Give me utterance. Give me, help me be able to um, take some difficult verses and be able to explain them clearly. May, Lord, I, I really need you to guide me in, in this. Lord, this morning I'm getting up and I have a list of things that I need to do. But Lord, help me as I do those things. Try to seek opportunities to share you with others. Simply by asking questions. If they quote a verse... Make sure you're familiar with it and use even that verse to help them understand what Christ wants to do in their life. Don't chicken away. Drive into the opportunity and you know what's going to happen? You might find somebody like you, Savio Perez, that's me, who would say, yes, I've been struggling with this. I've been wrestling with the Lord for a long time, but boy, do I need this. And I went on my knees and I said, Lord Jesus Christ, I've been running away from you for a long time. But I'm tired of running. <coughs> I understand now that you are just and you have to punish sin. You would not be just if you didn't do it. But boy, that was, that's bad news. But boy, the good news is that you already paid for it. I never understood that. It was a mystery to me. But these men explained it to me and the Holy Spirit helped me understand it. The 4th of November of 1980, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I can almost tell you the minute, I got on my knees. That's a very proud, arrogant Spanish person, 24 years old, who went on his knees and prayed, Jesus, please save me. You know what happened to Steve and Johnny? They disappeared. I was in California one time in uh, Fremont preaching in a church and I gave my testimony. I shared these names and somebody in the congregation raised their hand at the end of the service. They came to me and said, I know Steve. By the way, I got him on the phone. I was up in Germany a, few, a couple of months ago and they asked me to give my testimony. I shared the name uh, uh, Steve Pico. Somebody said, I, got, I know Steve. I know their daughter. We went to college together. I have his phone number. You want to talk to him? I said, yeah, I want to talk to him. I want to tell, tell him what he's done, how the Lord used him to change my life. And every time I talk to Steve and I say, Steve, I was never worthy of you. I was never worthy of the message that you gave me, but you were faithful to give it to me. And I love you for that. But I want to tell you it's not in vain. In these last 42 years since we last saw each other, the, the baton of the gospel has moved on. And I want you to know, Steve, that the Lord now has me as a missionary in Andalusia. Do you know where Andalusia is? I have no idea. Don't worry about it. One day we'll talk about it in heaven. You know, the, the Lord has control. But we need to be obedient in the way we share our Lord Jesus Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, help us not be afraid to share you. Help us not be ashamed. Help us be bold. And help us do our homework. Help us get into scripture. Memorize some verses. Find a method that we can feel comfortable with. And then launch out there and try to seek people like this unit. Or just simple people who might just be walking down the street. Who knows what's going to happen there. That might never get saved, but that's okay. At least we will be obedient, sharing the message. 
Lord, help us this afternoon. Help us be good witnesses of Jesus Christ, of the wonderful work of redemption that you have done in our lives. Help us, Lord. You, we never know what will turn out if we get to lead someone to the Lord. I'm glad that you're always in control. We might not get to see the person again after they make a profession of faith, but that's okay. Because again, you're in control. But help us, Lord, be faithful. Help us, Lord, be bold. Help us put our trust in you and help us be ready. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.